Wonderful. Thanks, Russell. Uh, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> a bit like an old Fasico reunion here. I can see uh, a lot of my ex colleagues. So, special hello <laughs> to you all, you lot. So, this evening, yeah, let's talk about hydrogen measurement. Um, and of course, the better you can measure, uh, the more able you are to control hydrogen. I'm going to start with a few slides uh, that you will all be familiar with, uh, but will hopefully help set the scene. Aluminium will happily dissolve most things, but the only gas that is appreciably soluble in aluminium is, is hydrogen. And even then, we talk about very low levels, typically tenths of a part per million. But even at these low levels, hydrogen can cause significant problems with macro or micro porosity. The source of that poor hydrogen is uh, generally water vapor. Hydrogen will react readily with water vapor to produce those twin evils of metal quality hydrogen oxides. Sources of water vapor uh, include the metal charge, any refractories that haven't been fully dried out, or metal treatment additives. You keep your bag of flux open, it will happily absorb water, which will be uh, then added to the melt. But all of these are manageable. Um, the other major source of water vapor is from the atmosphere, which is obviously beyond our control. Atmospheric conditions of temperature and humidity can have a significant effect on hydrogen pickup and how much the, the melt will absorb. I'm sure you've all seen this graph before. Uh, two things to note. One is a sharp increase in hydrogen solubility with increasing temperature in the liquid aluminium. And the sharp decrease in hydrogen solubility at the phase change from liquid to solid. And it's this sharp drop that causes the, dis the dissolved hydrogen to come out of solution, was all the problems. So, too much hydrogen can be a problem, it will form gas porosity, but it uh, also has its uses. Uh, some hydrogen can be helpful in some types of casting and. and uh, have some processes to counteract shrinkage. So we can think of it being an optimum hydrogen, hydrogen level for any given casting process combination. Over the years, several foundry test methods have become established in the industry, all relying on a vacuum, on applying a vacuum to a liquid sample of the alloy to encourage the hydrogen to come out of solution. In the center, there are the two extremes of these types of tests of the low and high hydrogen levels. The simplest method is the reduced pressure test or RPT. The sample is solidified under a vacuum, any hydrogen will form porosity, and then the, the sample is simply sectioned uh, and compared with the visual standard. The density and density index machine is a little bit more complex. Uh, where, where the sample, solidified sample, can be measured for density, and in density index is a ratio of two samples, one solidified in air and one solidified you know, under a vacuum. And these measured values can be compared with, uh, with company specifications. These tests have served the industry well for many years, but there, there are drawbacks. Inclusions can have an influence as they provide nucleation sites for the hydrogen. And there is the potential for the operator to influence the result. I did watch once uh, uh, an operator happily writing down the required, uh, required density index rather than what it was actually measuring. Now I'd like to turn to the direct measure of measurement of hydrogen, which is precise and quantitative values of, of the dissolved hydrogen. 
These devices have been used for many years in the wrought aluminium industry. Essentially, we talk about a probe that is immersed in the aluminium and an analyzer that processes the signal from the probe and displays a value on the screen. Micro is a relatively new device which is becoming um, established now in the wrought industry. What I would like to do is describe a, a brief history of the, uh, of the technology, the science behind it, some of the practicalities and, and how it could be applied. The sense of technology was developed by Cambridge University uh, in the UK. It was then licensed and manufactured by EMC. The initial development work to turn this into a practical uh, piece of equipment uh, was in collaboration with Fasico. That uh, Fasico, that, that collaboration ended and uh, EMC went alone, uh, and the device is now rebranded as HiCal. The heart of HICO is an electrochemical sensor, a ceramic uh, body sealed inside as a hydrogen reference material. The sensor will then generate an electrical voltage that is dependent upon the difference in partial pressure of the known reference inside and the un any, any unknown concentration of hydrogen outside of the cell. Close up of the sense of construction. The, the body is a, a solid electrolyte which is, becomes conducting at molten aluminium temperatures, which allows the circuit to be completed and uh, to generate the voltage which is proportional to the difference between the, the, uh, the reference inside and the unknown uh, hydrogen concentration outside. The sensor cannot come into direct contact with the aluminium, so it is located in a measurement chamber at the end of a probe and separated from the metal by a porous graphite cap. You can see on the, on the left, the left here. The remainder of the probe is, con is constructed from a ceramic, uh, resistant to attack by aluminium, so Cylon, uh, and then metal leading finally at the end uh, where there's a, a quick fit connector to attach the probe to the analyzer. The schematic of uh, how Michael makes the measurement. Uh, first thing to note is the ability to pass a purge gas through the probe uh, which serves two functions. First, we can put an inert gas through, which purges the probe prior to measurement. Or we could put through a, a hydrogen containing gas, a gas of a known hydrogen concentration, which can be used to provide a validation of a probe function. See the uh, uh, chamber hit the sensor in, in sitting inside the chamber. The hydrogen will diffuse through the graphite cap into the measurement chamber. And there's also a thermocouple, which isn't shown there, but it is a, there's a thermocouple which provides a simultaneous readout of, of temperature. It's a diffusion process of hydrogen from in the melt through into the measurement chamber. So it, it's not an, it's not instant. It's a diffusion process which takes a certain amount of time. Progress is here is shown of this uh, diffusion is shown by the green shaded area. So at the start of the measurement, you see the inner gas purge where the hydrogen in red comes down to zero. Purge is then turned off and the hydrogen starts to diffuse into the measurement cavity. See the hydrogen starting to rise there. 
as it diffuses hydrogen within the, in the cavity starts to build. Final result, which is typically five to ten minutes, uh, is judged when the analyzer measures a rate of rate of change of uh, 1003 milliliters per 100 grams. So it's looking for that curve to level off. So it says this is the final reading. Successive measurements uh, are repeatable. Uh, results almost identical. This shows three successive measurements of purge followed by the measurement, purge and measurement. It's also worth noting that the once at equilibrium, once it has reached that, that equilibrium with the hydrogen concentration in the melt, but the sensor will react to changes in hydrogen in real time. Uh, this is a well, the probe has been immersed, immersed in a casting well over a period of time. You can see again the, red, the blue line hydrogen. It comes up to equilibrium, it then sits and measures. As long as the probe is left inert, immersed, it will continue to measure hydrogen and any changes in hydrogen. In this example, there's not much, uh, not much happening. In this example, <clears throat> which is um, uh, <clears throat> several metal treatments. Been taking place in the bath. You can see how the how the, the hydrogen uh, level is is followed in real time. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on. So to summarise uh, the measurement, uh, we need the partial pressure. Right. Difference in partial pressure between the sensor reference and the And the probe in the uh, within the probe cavity creates a voltage. This voltage is then read by the analyzer, which then produces the the final result in terms of concentration of dissolved hydrogen in the element. Now, to do that, it needs to know two things: one, the hydrogen solubility in the alloy, uh, and secondly, it needs to know the temperature. Uh, <coughs> So these are I've got three values that, um, that it needs to know. One is a known partial pressure within the sensor. It needs to know the alloy composition and needs to know the temperature. Now the known partial pressure within the sensor is, is probe specific and is determined when the probe, when the when the sensor is manufactured. So these are the so-called A and B constants. These are provided with each sensor, with each probe. Alloy composition, um, hydrogen solubility depends on the alloy, alloying elements. Some elements like magnesium will increase solubility. Some elements like copper will tend to suppress the solubility. These effects are summarized in the so called C and D constants, which are alloy specific. Um, the analyzers can be preset with a, with a number of uh, different alloys, uh, but there is an app available where you can enter your precise alloy composition and it will generate the C and D constant for that particular alloy. Of course, temperature uh, and the, the built-in thermocouple in the probe sends the temperature to the analyzer. Uh, a little reminder of the uh, why temperature is important because solubility changes so much with the temperature. And some of the practicalities of high cal there are essentially two components: the, the probe that 
measures the partial pressure of hydrogen temperature and the analyzer which calculates concentration of dissolved hydrogen. There are three basic models of uh, analyzer, ICAL itself, ICAL Mini and ICAL 100. So I'll describe in a little bit the more detail in a minute. The probe is the same for each analyzer. The probe is common. First, the high cal itself, which is becoming well established in the wrought aluminium industry. It's a fully automated unit, very easy to use. The control of the gas purge is, is automated. There is a software which guides the operator through the measurement, step by step. It will display in real time. Uh, Hydrogen concentration and temperature, both as values and charted versus time. There's onboard diagnostics, which constantly uh, monitor the condition of the probe and will alert the operators to any potential problems and give some advice on, on how to resolve those problems. And it can be easily integrated into customer IT systems. So it, it can be linked directly into into quality control system. This is an example of the, the HiCal software. Uh, the page is where you can select the alloy type, where you enter the uh, probe A and B values. There's also a PC software which is able to, um, which can be used to download either via USB or Ethernet and import it into the PC software. We can produce graphs, charts of the, um, of the results, or in spreadsheet form. So all the results it generates are generated automatically and recorded automatically uh, and, and downloadable PC or directly into into post control system. An example of the, the diagnostics page. Um, one is alerting the operator that the probe impedance is too high, possible reasons and, and actions that the operator can follow to, to resolve the situation. Nikar Mini, um, which is a much simpler device, uh, has reduced functionality compared to the HICAM. The control of the gas purge is, is manual, but it will still display uh, in real time, hydrogen and temperature as numeric values. And the data is automatically recorded on an, on an SD card, which uh, can be downloaded. Like a date, uh, exported to Excel. And again, we can either produce a, a chart view or a spreadsheet view of the results all logged automatically. HiCal 100 basically contains all of the internals of the, the HiCal unit, uh, but it's designed to be in integrated into a degassing unit. Uh, allows, obviously, control over the final hydrogen content of a degassing process. We see the the optimization of the degassing process. A to B is the, uh, the where the hydrogen has reached its equilibrium within the probe. B to C, the degassing process. Again, you can see the, the hydrogen level is followed in real time. Of 
on the applications for HiCal. Well, obviously spot measurements, just measuring a uh, one-off measurement in a, in a furnace or a dip well. Continuous monitoring, as we've seen before. We leave the probe immersed, it will faithfully follow change, any changes in hydrogen concentration. Hydrogen control when connected to a degassing unit. And all of these measurements can be used to process development or process optimization. I've seen this graph before, but it's the continuous monitoring in a casting well. Hydrogen can and will change with time, uh, with changing weather conditions, atmospheric conditions. But being able to monitor continuously like that enables you to establish control limits. You can set upper and lower limits to help ensure that you keep your hydrogen level within those limits at an optimum level for your particular casting. Back to this chart, which I showed previously. Again, this is a, this is a gassing and degassing, uh, sorry, a gassing and degassing cycle, where a customer is wanting to optimize his degassing process. Here we see the initial purge. The, the measurement, the, uh, the initial measurement where the level in the bath was point, uh, about 0.23 millimeters per 100 grams. And we have a degassing process. I'll stop using the cursor. <laughs> the degassing process, then you'll see the, the hydrogen start to rise. This is where a, a chemical uh, gassing tablet was added. You can see the, the hydrogen level start to rise from the 0.5 that it was after the initial degassing up towards 0.3. And at the right hand side there you'll see the hydrogen start to fall again and that is again when the, when the second degassing cycle commenced. The final reading and again the final uh, hydrogen back down to zero as the purge gas was reintroduced. Another example uh, of two things really. One is the um, how it can be used to validate a new degassing process and it also shows the use of the uh, hydrogen containing gas to validate the function of the probe. Um, you see on the left the initial measurement, initial uh, purge down to point A. Now this was a one, with a 1% 1 hydrogen gas. So A was calculated to be the, the correct level for that gas. The gas was purge gas was turned off and uh, the melt, the hydrogen concentration of the melt was measured at point B. Point B, the 1% gas was turned back on again, so you can see the value come down to show that the probe was functioning correctly. That's at point C. Uh, point D, degassing uh, process started. With the, with the probe out of the melt. melt. The probe was then reintroduced again with a 1% hydrogen, uh, which came down to point E again to validate that the probe was, was working correctly, giving the correct value. Point E, the gas was turned, the 1% the hydrogen was turned off, and the hydrogen level rose to point F, which was the level of, of hydrogen in the bath. Probe was then removed and a further degassing process took place. Uh, point G, probe was reintroduced and from G to H it was in the in the metal during the whole of the degassing process. This was used to validate that uh, 
uh, a new degassing rotor. So, really the final slide now just to summar summarize. Um, high calc will give you a real time measurement of hydrogen, accurate and repeatable. We're able to um, all have full data management recording, the automated recording and storage of data will give you traceability and the possibility of hydrogen control. You have a short video now which was produced by uh, our German agent. Good time to show that, Russell. I'm not quite, told that, not quite sure how long I've taken. Yeah? No, you're all right. Carry on. Carry on. Doing all right. It lasts about uh, seven minutes or so. I'm hoping you can hear the music while the big talk over it. The entries in high cal by the way of touch screen. This is the data, initially the data required to set the unit up for a particular hour. This is the probe data for the A and B constants for this particular probe. Those Z numbers I didn't mention during the presentation, but they are the, the impedance of the probe at two different temperatures, and they are used to, to monitor the condition of the probe. Actually, sorry, Andy, is there any chance you could turn the music off the, the presentation? It's just we're struggling to hear you uh, and the music at the same time. I'm just I'm sure bring the volume down. down. You can't turn the volume down. down. Work? No, it's no. all right. Carry right. on. If, it, if it's
That's it. <clears throat> All the degassing machines are available. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, that's come through on the chat, so um, I hope you're ready for these. <laughs> The first one, uh, the first question is to do with the, um, if you go back to maybe the first few slides of your presentation, it talks about, a, um, let's say, a, a reference uh, reference sample, I think. Um, I've not got page number, but it's the schematic of the... Uh, that one? It could be that one, yeah. You've got hydrogen reference material. So, what what yeah. does that sort of take the form of? Then is that something that's got a known quantity of um, hydrogen in it, or what's that? Yes, it's a, it's a metal hydride of a known of a known uh, partial pressure of hydrogen. Yes. Right. Okay. So that's like your reference then. So you know you've got a you know <clears throat> a measured amount of of hydrogen within that. Uh, that that's the known. Yes. That's known. Okay. Um, a couple of other questions that have come in as well. Thanks for that. Um, does the equipment show? I'm just reading this off the chat. Does the equipment show any significant benefit of sending all feed, sprues, runouts, etc.? I guess revert back to a secondary smelter as opposed to feeding them back into furnaces on site. Um, I think this question is uh, really if if the if, we, if you have revert as the foundry and you send it to a secondary smelter, um, presumably the secondary smelter obviously would melt it down again, presumably deoxidize it and, and send it back. So um, is that something that you could, you know, you could measure that uh, um, melt that, or those, those those ingots, let's say, that came back from the smelter and measure you the amount of hydrogen in there? Once you've remelted those ingots in a furnace, you could take a take a measurement um, of what the hydrogen was. I mean, there, there would be some influence on the again from atmospheric conditions on the day. Yeah, it wouldn't necessarily yeah. be the precise hydrogen level in the ingots that you receive from the remelter. No, would you expect it to be lower though? If you've if you've sent it off to a secondary smelter and um, they send it well, they're not obviously sending this exactly the same material back, no. are they? But um, um, it would depend if the secondary smelter uh, did any degassing treatment. If the if the secondary smelter simply melted it and cast into ingots, I would expect it to be a relatively high level. If the yeah. smelter has a degassing unit and, and Treats the metal before casting into ingots, then it will be lower probably. Yeah. Is there is there a, a sort of a, a an industry practice then for aluminium secondary smelters? Is that something that they um, that they do? Do they degas, deoxidize? Um, I I don't know to be honest. I think I think most most of these these days most will will use a degassing machine. Mm. Uh, but yeah. I, uh, it will depend on. You'd the think industry. so, wouldn't you? <laughs> you'd think so. Maybe you would hope so. <laughs> well, maybe you'd hope so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question that's come in: What's the maximum bath size that can be successfully processed? Measured. Um, uh, I think it, was. it says processed, but let's go with measured. Yeah. Yeah, measured. Um, you can measure really anything as long as you have access. I mean, we've done measurements in uh, holding furnaces of several tons. That one example I showed you was in a when it was in a big transfer ladle, I think of about two or three tons. And the other well, the other example I showed you was in a, <clears throat> a furnace of about fifty kilos. So as long as you can get have access, yeah, it will it will you can take a measurement in, in any sort of volume. Okay, okay. And another question is, um, I know this depends solely on the alloy, I suppose, and the application, but roughly speaking, what's the, um, there obviously a, a level of hydrogen that, you know, you, you would get in the, in the melt. What's the sort of rough hydrogen level um, that you would get to before you start generating things like gas porosity? 
you know, it, it depends a little bit on the casting process and the casting, but generally I'd say if you're around 0.1 level, then you'll be fine. Uh, if you get towards 0 0.15, 0 0.2, you're on the Per 100 gram. Well, uh, yeah, millimeter per 100 grams. So yeah. yeah I'll, I'll come back to the second uh, rustle there. Uh, <clears throat> get towards 0 0.2, you might be expecting some problems. But if you're uh, a die caster and, and want a bit of hydrogen to, to counteract shrinkage, then that 0 0.2 level might be what you're aiming for. So, you know, it, it does depend. And again, mm. I think this is one of the, the beauties of this type of equipment. You can be able to measure quantitatively. You can quite precisely define what hydrogen level you need to produce your uh, particular casting. Mm. And then be able to try and stick to that as, as much as possible. <laughs> on, on the on the unit, so I was going to mention in the presentation, I forgot. Um, it's a bit of a strange unit in the least 100 grams. It, it did derive from the wrought industry, you know, which has used these devices for, for many years. Um, it's a bit of a strange unit. It is more or less equal to a part per million. So 0 0.1 milliliters per 100 grams is virtually 0 0.1 part per million. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question that's that's come in: How long do the probes probes typically last? Yeah, we say um, 100 measurements or 20 hours continuous immersion. <laughs> You can think of the, the sensor here, which is in front of you, as a, as a, as a battery. It's the best way I've ever <laughs> have of understanding how it works. And every time you use it to make a measurement, you consume some of that battery. And so mm. there is a finite life, but like a battery, it depends a little bit on how you use it, how long it will last. But those are the figures that, that are normally quoted. 100 measurements, individual measurements, or 20 hours continuously. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one more question is the um, uh, one from me actually. Uh, it's been on my mind since uh, since I first saw the uh, the presentation and, and the video. Is um, you showed one of one example. I think it was the largest unit that you do, which is typically linked with a, a degassing unit. And, and I think you saw on the video you've got almost like a live monitoring situation. Um, does that then, if if the hydrogen levels um, increase above a certain limit, does that um, work in conjunction with the um, the degasser or the deoxidizer um, equipment in terms of trying to bring the hydrogen levels down if it falls up or starts to rise above a certain level? Is that uh, possible to automate that uh, process? It is possible, yes, because it's an, it's an electrical signal, so you can make use of the electrical signal to to trigger the operation of a degassing unit on a switch it on or switch it off. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. possible. To so do the that. two obviously work in conjunction with each other. Then it's it's not just measuring, you know, it's it's serving as a trigger point, isn't it? If it goes above a certain amount, then you know you you, it will you trigger the operation, and that gives you that yeah element of control, not just measuring, but also the control of hydrogen yeah yeah okay another question's come in uh to ensure the lowest quantity of hydrogen per ladle would it be best to degas locally at the holding furnace immediately before it goes into the, or immediately before it goes into the furnace so when's the best what's the best time to degas let's say uh i would always say as close to casting as possible i would imagine sorry as close to the as close to casting as possible, I would imagine. Yes, correct. Yes, so the, the last possible moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, has anyone else got any questions uh, for Andy? We've taken a, a, f a few questions there on the chat. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to ask a, a question directly to to Andy. Um, Maybe Richard, if you could just uh, unmute everybody. We've not got a huge number of people on the call, unfortunately, tonight. But um, 
what we will be doing is obviously this is a recorded session so we'll make this available to uh, ICME members um, and it will be uploaded to the uh, to the ICME website but uh, if anyone does want to mute their uh, unmute their microphone and ask Andy a question please feel free to do so Yeah, and Andy, once the, um, in, in terms of uh, hydrogen going back into revert um, from casting processes, is there a particular process which tends to pick up the, the greatest amount of, uh, of hydrogen as everything gets sort of moved around? So is it always die casting, pressure die casting that's likely to give you the greatest amount of hydrogen that comes back in um, via nature of the coolants and lubricants? or is sand casting just as bad as absorbing moisture back through through moulds as everything sort of cooling and knocking out? No, I think I think you're right, uh, Richard. The, the dirty scrap, the dirty returns from pressure die casting with all the, the lubricants, etc., would would be would be higher, would lead to a higher hydrogen concentration on re Good question. Thank you, Richard. Anyone else got a question for Andy? I've, actually, I've got I've got another one based on the one about where to degas the um, the ladles. If if the best place yeah. to gas and treat the metal is immediately before it goes into the furnace before use, why is it so many uh, so many foundries tend to do all of the degassing and handling processes immediately at the bulk melting areas and then transport the metal? Around the site where it can slop around in uh, in mobile crucibles on forklift trucks, etc. Well, I think it's it's, it's practicalities really. Um, if you're talking about a central melting system uh, distributing to uh, die casters, for example, it's probably just a simple of question of, of economics and, and practicalities. You you have a a single degassing machine or sometimes two degassing machines at the melting station. Um, if you've got 30 die casting machines or you've got 30 low pressure die casting machines to, to treat in each of those, you'd have to have 30 more degassing units. And it's uh, not so practical to do that. It's, it's not ideal. Um, but that central melting central treatment is often the most practical way of doing it <clears throat> but you're right I mean, it, once you know a die casting machine has been has been filled with aluminium then the possibility is that it will start to rise away the hydrogen concentration will start to rise away from the ideal rise away from what it was when it was first treated um, you can check, uh, again, HICO will enable you to, to check and monitor any changes in hydrogen in the holding furnaces and in the casting furnaces. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks for those questions, Richard. Um, one more time, has anyone got any anything they want to ask Andy before we wrap up? No, I think that's it. Um, well, other than that, I want to, to thank you very much, Andy, for your for your time and your technical presentation this evening. It's um, really interesting, actually, to, to learn about the process and um, understand a little bit more about this uh, this this uh, rather important situation for for any uh, any foundries out there that are melting aluminium. So I'd give you a round of applause. Thank you for that. Thank you.